Well, I, I just, they probably don't want me to do this, but I just want to thank the worship team for all the effort that they do and the words and the time because they make ready. They make ready at rehearsal. They re make ready early in the morning. They put in the time and the effort, and I, I'm so thankful for that because we get to participate and they facilitate the worship that we get to encounter. And so I am just thankful for that, for the amount we can, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And this season seems to be so much about making ready, right? We make ready uh, the reasons th uh, to make ready for the shopping that we need to do. We make ready for the relatives that go are going to visit us. We make ready to blow our budget that we thought we were going to keep in the month of December. <laughs> we make ready in lots of ways. And so as we settle in this morning, uh, I want us to make ready to receive and, and to, to hear what God has for us. And so, um, for us guys, though, it's a little bit different. Um, we don't really seem to make ready all the time for um, the Christmas season. We suddenly realize on December 24th that Amazon doesn't ship the same day. And uh, I recall one time I was really uh, in a panic where I did wait to the last minute. And I was very desperate. I visited a, a Kmart. And um, it was December 24th, and I had a list of things I needed to buy. And I found that I was not alone as everyone else in the store was also a, a, a male with the same desperate look on their face and full of trinkets and best guesses of what their loved ones would want. And the funny thing about guys in that state is when we come in, we don't, we don't go for shopping carts. We, we have no time for that because if we did that, that would hinder our ability to hunt and scour and, and look for the things that we need to, to um, scavenge for our, our work and, uh, and our purchases. And so, um, but I just remember that just being a very um, interesting moment of, as I was walking to the store, it was like me and seven other men just hunting and <laughs> we did not make ready and uh, <laughs> there was consequences for that as the way it resulted showing up on Christmas morning as things were unwrapped with disappointing looks <laughs> um, but I've been there I'll never go back as, as far as that and um, sadly there is a feeling of desperation for many who will not take the time the effort or make preparations to make ready in this Christmas season and if you think I'm still talking about shopping, then I got to tell you, I'm going to clue you in on where I'm going with this. You see, the theme this week in Advent is preparing for the coming of the Savior. Amen. And for that, we must make ready his arrival so that it takes shape in our day-to-day -day lives. Be encouraged, people of God, for the presence of the Lord is among us, seeking to captivate you by his adoration. And I must ask you this morning, right at the get-go, has God's liberating love for you captivated your heart? Has the miraculous forms of his affection for you caught your attention yet? Have you been intrigued by the unparalleled compassion of our God? And I think that's a really key question. And I ask that because there is a great sense that I have as a pastor that there is not enough of us who have a sense that the reason for this season is to live in a manner because they realize that they've been touched or they've been able to surrender to that love that God has for them. It's key. Many of us struggle with, I think, identifying that we're actually lovable by God. I think probably all of us, not most of us. And as we step further into the conversation this morning of living this wonderful life, which is our, our theme for the last month or so, I want to encourage you that it's not by the merit of your efforts that promote or produce the love of God for you, nor is it the, the themes or the thoughts of God that you could come up with that determine whether his love is going to rain down in the direction of your life. It's really that you need to realize right from the beginning that you are able to receive the love of God because he just loves you. He created you. You are precious. And if you first can identify that you are able to receive that, then I think it helps us to make ready for more of that love in our lives. So I encourage you to make a rejoicing 
effort in your life to make ready. As we expect the work of Jesus to take shape in our lives, are we able to honestly say that we're preparing for his presence? That's where I want us to kind of consider this morning. Are we making ready for the Savior? I'm curious what it's like for you to make ready each and every day. For, for example, last night I started to make ready for this morning, which is why I was able to wear a tie today. And, uh, and so I made those efforts, ironed those clothes. What's it like for you when you make ready on a Monday or a Thursday or a Tuesday? All of us have a routine. Some of us wake up at 5, some of us wake up a little bit later, some of us eat breakfast, some of us can't stand the thought of food in the morning, some of us shower in the morning, some of us shower the night before, some of us shower the night and the morning, and you know, we're just, whatever it is. Some of us drink something hot, some of us don't. But we do this because we have to have a routine so that it prepares us for the day. It prepares us for what's to come. It prepares us to be able to um, receive and respond and succeed in the day. We make ready for our lives. But I want us to consider how is it that we make ready each and every day to receive the Lord. As a 23-year-old, when I was a youth worker, I had a mentor at the time, Big Tom. And Tom, it didn't matter where he slept the night before, whether it was one of our youth camps, getting out of a sleeping bag off a cold floor, or if it was on a conference, getting out of a hotel cot, his six foot eight frame barely fit in. Tom demonstrated to me that the very first thing that he did each and every morning was he would wipe the sleep out of his eyes, and then he would grab this. And he would just open it up and he would just go. And that really impressed a lot upon me about how he lived his life. Because I looked at his life. I looked at the fruit of his life. I looked at the things he was reaping in his life. Because he sowed a lot of amazing fruit in his life. Because he had an amazing career, an amazing job, an amazing kids. It wasn't perfect, trust me. But I was looking at the difference between how he lived. Because I had this window of seeing Tom how he sowed and started each day, and how, what that meant for the, the life that he was living, how it enabled him to love teenagers where they were as they were struggling with their identity and their faith. And so I saw Tom make ready each and every day room for the Lord. So as we're here this morning at church, how is your life? Is it empty or is it full? Are you ready for Christmas or are you perhaps maybe a little bitter or apathetic or looking down on it because your mind perhaps is filled with lists of tasks rather than filled with the focus of God's spirit in your life? And it's truly sad when people, especially the people of God, get so twisted up and full of stress and how they're going to give material things when we should be a people full of joy because it's about receiving what we actually received in this season as a way back to be reunited with God through the Son. And it seems that when we put into our lives the items that are shallow or materialistic, our lives resemble shallowness and materialism. Yet if we put in our lives that which are of the character of God, if we sow into our lives the love that God demonstrates to us, we somehow receive more than I think we were ever expecting. For example, we just did Operation Christmas Child, and we were filling boxes for children, and we were sending it across the world, and they're going to be opening it up this Christmas time, and they're going to hear the gospel message. And we did this assembly line on the packing night. And if you missed it, I encourage you to come next year. It's an amazing thing. And one of my daughters was filling the box, and she's like, it just, this just feels so good. It's kind of weird. I'm like, it's weird, huh? Yeah, it's just, I don't know what it is to just fill this box and give it to someone. And I was like, honey, my daughter, that's the Holy Spirit in you. That's the Holy Spirit manifesting in you that what you're doing is you are now sowing a seed that's going to be reaped with a child across the world, the love of God. You're sowing in the love of God, so what is reaped somewhere else in the world is that very same love. And that was a beautiful moment. 
And I'm thankful for that because it just reminds us, of course you're going to feel full when you're sowing in the love of God in your life. Have you ever had a moment like that where you are um, in tune with God's love for you or for others? And suddenly you're like, wow, what is this? It suddenly goes from a myth to real, right? When God reveals himself to you, it goes from a theory to a fact. It goes from something that you can't touch to something you can touch. See, I love, I, we redid this stage so that I can move around. Sometimes it may make you feel uncomfortable. I hope not. But it's important that when we seek to live a life for God, that what we need to realize, what is it that we're actually sowing? into our hearts? What is it we're actually receiving from God? And from this, we're going to turn to the reading of Hosea. Now, Hosea is to be viewed as the earliest prophet who interpreted the nature of God, not as a God of wrath, but as a God of love. He was Israel's first evangelist. Ever seen an evangelist before? It's probably on TV, right? Or it's on a street corner with a sandwich sign and a really offensive, like, ah, how dare they kind of feel when you see them, right? Recently, I saw an evangelist when we, as a group, as a, as a, um, a ministry opportunity, we went down to um, the Golden One Center. And we were at Winter Jam, and we were leaving with our youth, and we just got really excited from worshiping God, and, and we left Golden One Center, and there on the street corner was an evangelist with a bullhorn and a, and a sign, and, and the sign says something to the tune, Jesus is returning. Are you ready? And well, church, I want to preach today in hopes that when that question is asked of you, you will, with more confidence and more conviction, be able to say, yes. I am ready. I am ready for the Savior. So, that's what I want to preach about today. So, uh, before we dive in and read this verse, I want you to say to someone, are you ready? Go ahead, say to someone, are you ready? I hope they didn't look shocked when you asked them that. <laughs> All right, let's read, read this. Hosea, chapter 10, verse 12. So, with a view to righteousness... Reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. How many times have you realized after you reaped something that you should have probably sowed a different seed? <laughs> And it usually comes to the tune when you got something different than what you intended. Maybe you should have perhaps been more authentic, more you should have given more of yourself, or you should have not had maybe an aim of self-interest in a relationship or in a situation because what you received out of that was nothing you wanted or what you intended to, to get. We ha there's a relationship between what you put in and what you get in this life, and it's the same when it comes to a life of living for God. Take inventory right now. What is it that you are sowing in your life when it comes to the love of God? What is it perhaps you find that you're not receiving from God right now? Because it's clear to me that Hosea is not talking about earth and organic matter. He's talking about the heart. He's talking about your heart. Sowing with a view to righteousness. So when we are planting, when we're investing, when we are taking in, when we're studying, when we're bringing information or thoughts or truth into our life, how can we go and sow with a view to righteousness? It's like if I just said, hey, go find righteousness and viewing that, put that into your life. It'd be kind of abstract, right? It's kind of, I don't know, do I go to the library? Do I, where do I go? You know, <laughs> internet search. What do I do with that? Because righteousness, I think most of the time gets a bad rap. Because when we say, are you righteous? You suddenly run into the, no, I'm not self-righteous. No, that's not me. Oh, oh no, I'm not self-righteous. Because there's this fear that you'll be found thinking you're more holier than thou and whatnot. 
so I want to kind of twist that around with this understanding of what righteousness is, what rightness is, and how we are called to sow righteousness. So to have a view of righteousness, we have to go to a source. It's kind of like when you went to college or wherever in class, you, you trusted that what you were reading or what the teacher was giving you was good material, was sound material, were things to, that were credible, right? So the only place that I know that we can sow righteousness is by being able to go to this. This is where you need to fix your eyes to find righteousness. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, as the authority of truth in your life. There are so many thoughts and other practices that this is not in the room. Maybe it's on the bottom shelf at Walmart, like I talked about that one time, or it's in the mix of things. This is where you need to go and stick your nose in in order to find a view of righteousness. Like I said, this is what my mentor Tom did each and every morning. It didn't matter where he was. He was here. Amen. He was here. Here. And I don't know about you, but I'm a work in progress. And um, the word disciple, when you look in the Greek, it, it talks about being a learner. Are you a learner? Can you be taught? Or you got it all figured out? I don't got to figure it out. I'll tell you that. But that's the thing about being a disciple. It's not this soft word. No, if you're saying I'm a disciple of Christ, it means I am learning from Jesus. And where can you find Jesus? Right here. <laughs> uh, love my enemies. Yeesh. How do I do that? <laughs> I'm married to them. No, just kidding. Uh, I'm not talking about me. Just kidding, my goodness. Remember that desperate look I talked about going to Kmart? You're about to see it. No, it's because Jason was in the back row falling asleep, so I was just waking him up. <laughs> but we go to the word, forgive, 70 times 7. <laughs> All right. Love your wife. Don't be harsh with your children. We go to the word, right? to find what it means to sow into a life of rightness with God. And it takes word. It takes work. Our eyes need to be fixed on living what we see taking shape in the gospel because it's really important. All the time, people don't have an answer, and I just want to go, hey, let's go here, and let's see what it says. For example, if we go to Colossians chapter 3, 8, eight and 10, it says this, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. I don't know about you, but that says a lot. And... I remember when I came to faith at 19, I, I cussed a lot at that time. And I worked at a bakery where it was nothing but dudes, so there was a lot of dude talk. And, and, uh, and I remember the first time after accepting Christ, and I, as a baker, I used to make scones and muffins. I had this big mixing bowl, and we'd have to wash out this really industrial hot um, water. And one time I went and I burned my hand. And I wanted to go, you know, say the words. But I held my tongue. Because for the first time, there wasn't just the old self within. There was a new self. There was a new character, a new practice. And I found myself in a conflict between the old and the new. I don't know if you've ever been there in a conflict between the old and the new. But what I realized is that I wanted to live into the new because of the love that I had discovered that God had for me. So since I had the love of God for me, I wanted to re return that room or that love by making room in my heart for God. It took work. It took discipline. As a disciple, as a learner, I had to grow in that. And as we grow, 
as a disciple, we can see that we're creating room for righteousness, rightness with God. We can say that we are the righteousness of God because it's not from us. We are not holy. Nothing in this world is holy except the Lord. But once we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to awaken our hearts and our minds and to reveal our character and the way that we practice, the way that we spend our money, the way that we speak to one another, and we choose out of our will, which we never lose, to follow into his holiness, we become right with God. And that character, that new self that we get to put on is renewed in the knowledge of the Creator. That is power. That is opportunity. That is making ready and room to receive a Savior in your life. It's encouraging, isn't it, that if you can sow this seed of righteousness, that you find righteousness taking shape within you? As a pastor, I get a, a really unique view. I get to see people living in victory. I get to see people living in conflict and overcoming. I get to see people transforming. It's such a beautiful view because I see people working out their salvation day in and day out. Sometimes they fall down. Sometimes they just need prayer. Sometimes they're celebrating. But what I see is this amazing narrative, this amazing story of our lives that we live together, that God loves me, God loves you, and he seeks to transform you by this redemptive love. And in that, we get to participate. And in that, we get to be encouraged that we get to overcome. And, and it's amazing when you see that take shape in lives when sometimes people don't recognize you anymore. Ever had that before? You, you who are, how? It's amazing when it's, you are receiving those questions, right? How is this possible? The love of God. That's all I have. That's all I have. The love of God. I, the old is gone. The new has come, right? That's what we get to live into. That's how we get to live as a, in the rightness with God. And it's challenging. And so many times I see people say, I want to get right with the Lord. I'm so glad you have that. But sometimes we see people making efforts. They clean their house. They, they clean their car. They, they clean their act. They, they clean up their face. They, and they clean all these things so that they can invite people they hardly know to say, wow, you live in a beautiful home or you're so attractive or you have a nice car. Or, look at your life. Or, look at your kids. But in the, on the inside, we're still a mess. On the inside, we, we don't bother to make room. We don't bother to make room where we make room for strangers in our homes, but we don't make room on the inside for the king of kings. Think of that difference. How are you sowing into your lives so that you can reap righteousness? It's key. It's key. It takes effort to be a disciple. And even though Christ was born in a stall for mules and goats full of filth, God chose to bring him into the world that way, his most precious son, as a demonstration that we don't have to be clean, we don't have to be ready and perfect in order to receive the Savior in our hearts. It's kind of like saying, I'm going to go to the gym, but when I get fit, I'll start going, you know? <laughs> no. We need to receive the Lord as you are right now. The time is now. That's the amazing message of the gospel. The time is now to receive his righteousness and his love. Because I would argue that as God's blessed and chosen people, and that's who you are, the God who created all this existence loves you, created you. There's no one else like you. As my wife and I talked about this week, you are his favorite you. In that, we get the chance to encounter the choice to either live in spiritual fullness or remain in spiritual fallowness, shallowness, emptiness. Have you ever seen a field that's fallowed? It's turned over. It's a mess. 
it's arid and perhaps dry. Nothing fruitful grows there except weeds. And I think sometimes we, as the people of God, sell ourselves short because we allow a portion of our heart to remain fallow. God, you can have this part of my life. You can have my Sundays, but I'm not giving you my Saturday nights. We don't allow ourselves to integrate our, our God into every part of ourselves. I'll give you that time on a Wednesday night because it's a Bible study, but the rest of the day, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be obedient. And I think something happens is that we as the people of God, when it comes to the word, there's two things about us. We are malnourished is one. What do I do in this? How do I handle the stress? How do I handle rejection? How do I handle joblessness? How do I handle people who persecute me? How do I handle rejection? How do I handle anxiety? How do I handle fear? It's in here. It's in here. And this isn't just a book. This is the living word. We have this understanding that the Holy Spirit is what reveals truth. The Holy Spirit is alive for us. That we are able to read from this and there's this relationship between your heart and God where he reveals the truth for you. That's why sometimes you go, this is exactly what I'm going through. That's so weird. <laughs> Life is full of coincidence. No, it's not. It's the power of God Amen. seeking to transform you into who? His image. The other thing is that we take this and we go, thanks, Pastor. And we, and we go home and we go, mm, that's uncomfortable. That makes me want to change. That makes me want to sacrifice. That makes me want to be different. And then we just spit it out. We don't allow, digest it. We don't allow ourselves to be nourished by it. We don't allow ourselves to be transformed by it. Being a learner of this is chewing on those bits of truth, even though they're sometimes jagged, even though sometimes they just cut right to the very heart of the struggle. But that is what we seek because we trust that what we sow, we will reap something far greater than the world has to offer us. And I, I pray that as the people of God that you are not content with chewing on the weeds that the world has. Because really, I see that all the time. People chewing on the weeds. This event, this concert, this new album, this new event, this lifestyle, this choice, this, this relevant truth because I say it's relevant. It's just weeds. And you're going to find yourself continually malnourished, disorientated, turned over, arid and dry and empty like a fallow ground. That is what the world reaps. Hardened and unable to receive the Holy Spirit. To reveal and open up that even though there's pain and, and scars, they are satisfied with rebellion and disbelief. And the truth is, until you break up the fallow ground that is resisting the Lord, life will remain shallow. You will not be reaping from a fruit of righteousness. The same triggers are going to be pulled. The same scars of pain from the past are going to leave that twinge when it comes up. Habits of conflict, habits or struggles of addiction will flare up unbalanced emotions, all the forms of self-idolatry where you elevate yourself over God will continue to be reaped into your life. This life is meant to be lived from receiving the wonderful grace and love of God in forms of rightness with God. That's the key. That's the path. That's the hope. It's time to break up that fallow ground. It's time to make ready. Time to make room in your heart for the presence of Christ. Make ready to receive the righteousness that is found in a life pursuing Christ. To have it all surrendered to him. And the thing is that whether you realize it, whether or not your neighbor has or has not realized it, 
deep down in the very marrow of your bones, deep down in the very heart of your existence, what you most desire, what the world most desire, is to be reunited and connected with God. That's what we're made for, deep down. And you see someone twisted in all their malformed habits and values and morality. And I see someone who just is screaming out they need God. Even though they go, I don't need him. I don't believe in him. But deep down below all that, we know. We know how you're created. We know what you long for. We know what you seek. It's a matter of yielding your heart to sow that righteousness. And in the season of Advent, we must take inventory of that yearning for Jesus rather than the inv inventory of the stores that have the best Cyber Monday or Black Friday deals. What is all this about? This season. It's about receiving a Savior. It's about receiving a restored knowledge that we are able to be reconnected to our God and found, found lovable. That's what we need to receive and live on. If there's a fallow part of your heart, it's time to break it up. <laughs> time to make ready. It is time. Tomorrow morning, maybe you need to place the word by your smartphone. Maybe you need to place it on top of your smartphone. <laughs> maybe by the coffee pot. Maybe somewhere. Maybe tonight before you go to bed. How can you make ready to receive the Lord in the day that you have at hand? What do you need to sacrifice? 10 minutes? 20 minutes? 5 minutes? Just imagine what that would do to set up your day. Imagine. If you don't believe me, try it. Report back to me and let me know how it goes. Let's, 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 put, let's allow God to demonstrate to us by our willingness to trust him what he's willing to do with a little bit of faith. Let's see what he can do because I tell you, you're going to get way more than you put in. That's the economy of God. You offer a little, but it's full of your heart. You're going to get way more. That's the economy of God. Maybe it's time to make ready by being accountable and start committing to something like an anchor group, a small group that we have here, a mentoring relationship. Maybe you need a big Tom in your life, like I had. Maybe you are that person. So that you, what you can do is you can help others to make ready in their lives how to make room in their hearts. And finally, maybe it's time to make ready and room in your heart by serving this church. Serving this community. There are a bunch of kids back there that need God-loving adults in their lives. Our teens need that. Our, our ladies need friends. Our men need to not live in isolation. We need to continue to serve the homeless like we did yesterday as a church. We need to continue to make room so that what we get or what flows out of us is what we're reaping because we're sowing that rightness with God. It fuels us to, to be able to enable the power of God to take shape in this world. That's what we get to do when we make ready. Amen. It's a love that breaks apart the fear, the worry, the doubt, the lies. And I would say that the biggest lie is that you may believe two things when it comes to if you can live in a right way with God. First, you may believe that it's too late. I've messed up too much. It's been too long. I don't believe it enough. I'm not clean enough. I'm not good enough. There is no good enough. That's why he came. He came as a baby, died as our sacrifice, and rose as our Lord so that we could just be found loving, be found reunited with God. So it's not too late. The second is that righteousness may never come rain on you. It's never going to come to me. I'm going to put into it and God's not going to do anything. That's a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. He will reign in on your life. And the thing about Hosea here, he's a prophet that took place before Jesus. And he was expectant that the Lord was coming. Well, guess what? He came. 
and the righteousness of, the, of God is, is raining on us. It's already raining. It's already raining in your life. In the areas where it's dry, in the area where you struggle, if with a view of righteousness you spend time and in, in precious energy into the heart of God, you're going to find that his love is already raining on you. Seeking to transform you. Seeking to enable you. Seeking to break the bonds of slavery, of sin, of idolatry, of pride. So what yields is righteousness. You can say, I'm right with the Lord. Let me show you. Let me love you. Let me help you. Let me serve you. That is what it means to make ready. It's already ready. It's already raining. Are you ready? Are you ready? And I ask that because I know that if I ask you, what is it you need to submit to God? What is it you need to offer up? What shallow, pharaoh part of your heart, what habit, what time, what area of control you need to let go of, it's going to cause you to clam up. Because you, we like what we got, even if it is a weed. It takes risk, trust. Okay. I'm going to make ready. Here we go. <laughs> but we have to live in the truth. The love of God is quick to rain on you. It's quick to supply your need. It's quick to heal you. It's quick to transform you. It's quick to provide strength when you feel that you're so weak. Because it's not from you. It's from Him. And that's what we need to make ready for. Because I don't know about you, I would be shipwrecked and bankrupt if it wasn't for the Lord. Amen. And so I don't want any of you to be in that same boat. It's time to offer that over. It's time to make ready that place that you may be holding on to because of pride or fear so that we can have a view of righteousness so that we can take this, apply it, and watch God work. It's already raining. His love is raining on you. Are you ready to receive it? Don't put it off any longer. Sow into those seeds so that what you reap is a transformed heart and a new life. And that's not just fluffy talk. Because my life's been transformed. My wife's life's been transformed. So many as I get to know you, I hear the transformational story of God working in you. That's our narrative. That's our story. We're part of the Christmas story. Amen. And there's a world out there that, that doesn't know it. They're looking on Amazon for it. For free shipping. <laughs> hey, we got free shipping. It just, you just have to believe here and confess here. And it arrives brand new. Sorry, I'm salesman forgot it today, I, I, I guess. So are you ready? I'm looking for it here. There it is. I'm sorry, 9 o'clock service. I forgot this. 10.30 service. You get a little bit more today. I want you to grab one of these cards when you leave today. And they're over there on that by Lord, Lloyd's left shoulder there. Grab one of these. Bob and Chris or the usher will hand this to you. It says, are you ready? Ready? And I want you to put this somewhere on your dash, on your mirror, Next to the picture of you and your amazing spouse. I'm making up for earlier. <clears throat> ready? Ready. Are you ready to make room? Are you ready to receive the Savior in your life? To allow his love to break up those shallow, empty, twisted, malformed pieces that don't please God and say, here, take it. Give me a new heart. Give me a new view. Give me a new mind. Remo re renew my mouth. May may allow me to see the day as the opportunity and the gift that it is so that I can continue to grow in your image and love you and serve you and be fulfilled. Ready?